Everybody having a good new year so far? Amen? All right, we're doing okay. I don't know how what percentage of people that was that's having a good year, but I'm glad you are. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Genesis today, chapter 22. Starting a new series this morning that's called True Worship. If you all can remember back to the story, we preached on it a few weeks ago. Uh, we, we looked at this story several weeks ago um, about the Samaritan woman at the well. We're going to look at that here over the next few weeks, not today. I'm going to be talking about something else today. Um, but one of the things she was curious about was worship. And she wanted to know the right way to worship because in her mind, and we're going to look at this, I won't get too much into it. In her mind, some people were doing it right, some people were doing it wrong, and she wanted to know who was who. Jesus didn't say who was right, who was wrong. He simply replied saying there's coming a time and is right now that true worship, the true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. So I have studied over the last few months. I want to know scripturally, God, I want your word to speak to us, speak to this church, because above all things, what we need to be is true worshipers. It's nice for us to be good preachers and good listeners and good prayers and all this kind of stuff, but what God addressed, what Jesus simply addressed when it came to people who were in need was he gave them a revelation. The revelation was there's coming a time things are going to change, and the thing that's going to change is you're going to move from your concept and your reality of what you think worship is, and that's going to shift and that's going to change, and you're going to start seeing worship different, and you're going to start seeing what is true worship. So... Today, I want us to get into some, uh, some things. It's in Genesis chapter 22. There's a little bit of background I'm going to give you. This is the, the man Abraham. He has a son named Isaac. He, is, he was 100 years old before he got that son. And, uh, and God is uh, asking him uh, to go. We're going to start reading in verse 1, chapter 22. Verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now pause right there. You will see here and in other scriptures that they use the word test. God is testing somebody. If you go back to original King James, it might say tempt. Like it, it, it gets really crazy. God is tempting Abraham. Other, other places say that God is testing Abraham. Jesus himself went into the wilderness to be tested or tempted. Every time you see the word tested, if God is doing the testing, get your mind out of modern day 20, 20th century, 21st century Western thought of what a test looks like. A test is let's make sure you have all the knowledge that you need, you have all the skill that you need, I'm going to test you, and we're going to find out what you're doing wrong. So that's what a test is. Many of us in this room, it's been a long time since you've been to school. Many of us in this room, we took tests by filling in the bubbles on the Scantron. You all remember the Scantron? You all remember the number two pencil? Make sure you have your number two pencil tomorrow. We'll have a Scantron test, which I never in my life understood. I never saw a number one pencil. I never saw a number three pencil. But they said, make sure you have your number two pencils and you fill in the Scantron. And you fill all that in at the end of the day. And what they're doing is they're finding out what is he going to do wrong. And we're going to put the big red mark across what he did wrong. And then they hand back your test. You all remember these days in class, they were handing back the test, but they would do it like, you know, they would hand it back on your desk and they're going to be real slick about it and we're going to turn it over. This is private. Nobody can see it, right? But the teachers, at least mine anyway, always did this fancy thing where they like, we're going to keep it private, but they did it like this. Everybody can see all the red marks that go across your paper. We're going, hey, just want to keep this private between you and I. Don't let anybody see. And see, when we think about testing, we think about we're going to figure out what you don't know. We're going to find out what you don't know and put big red marks to it. If the Bible says that God is testing somebody, it has, you, we have a, a notion, the wrong notion of what that means. What it means is, God has decided that somebody needs to be pushed further than where they are. 
is what it means. When somebody's going to be, te- when they're tested in the Bible, it's not, let's find out what you're doing wrong. It's, you need, it is time to move further. Okay, so he's saying, Abraham, you're going to be tested. How are you going to be tested? Take your son, your only son, go to Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. We read that, and many of us have heard that since Sunday school time, and we don't think and we don't realize how crazy that is. Right? Take your son and kill him. Verse 3, so Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes, saw the place afar off, and Abraham said to the young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. I want to read that verse one more time. Keep it up. Verse 5. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. And we will come back to you. These men don't know what they're going up there to do. And when I was young, when I was naive, when I was immature and I read this scripture, I thought that Abraham was lying to them to cover up for what he was really going up there to do. Because you can't let these guys know I'm going up here to kill my son. They'll stop him. They'll kill him if they have to. You can't kill this little boy. I thought Abraham was like covering his tracks, telling a, a little white lie, telling a fib. Ah, we're going up here. We're going to worship. Until I realized Jesus later on is talking about true worship. And God is asking Abraham to do something, to move along further. And he's saying, to do that, I need you to go to this place that I'm going to show you. It's Mount Moriah. It's three days' journey. I need you to take your son, take him there, and you're going to offer him there as a burnt offering sacrifice. Abraham's going to do that. I preached on this months ago. And God poured out anointing and revelation for people really powerfully when we really dissected this story and talked about it. So I'm not going to get too much into that today other than to say, you need to understand what Abraham was planning on going up on that mountain to do. He considered worship. So let's talk about worship. Because when we talk about worship, many people, especially now, like I've said, 21st century Western church, American church, what we think of as worship is songs, which is a type of worship. We think of prayer. We think of the lifting of hands. All of these things are types of worship, all of these things are works of worship that you can do, but Jesus said true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. So it goes deeper than what you're doing. Because I want to go back to the idea that Abraham has been asked to do something crazy and it makes no sense to us as Christians and it would have made no sense to the readers of the Torah that would have been around the time of Moses, because Moses wrote this, it would have made no sense to them either. God asking them to sacrifice, asking him to sacrifice his son, because God doesn't kill children, right? He doesn't ask you to do that. This is strange. This is weird. Until we go back and we realize who Abraham is and where he came from. And who Abraham is and where he came from, he lived in a land called Mesopotamia. The Bible says he's from the land of Ur, you are. That's Mesopotamia. That is ancient, ancient culture. And those who have... It's been a long time since you were in history class and social studies. No, they don't teach us in social studies, whatever it is. History class, and they go back and they teach this stuff. This is one of the oldest cultures that they can find on earth, the Mesopotamian people. And they lived in what's called the Fertile Crescent, okay, which is now modern-day Iraq, uh, Iraq and Iran. And they lived there in this Fertile Crescent. It was called Mesopotamia. And Mesopotamia had... Uh, what we call polytheism, multiple gods, many gods. They worship the god of the sun, of the moon, of the stars. They worship the god of the field. They worship the god of the rain. They worship this god and that god. And 
to really truly honor and worship those gods, you sacrificed to them. And there was no greater and no higher sacrifice in a polytheistic society, especially an ancient one like Mesopotamia. There was no greater and higher sacrifice than human sacrifice. And that's why you find that in all ancient religions, the Mayas, the Incas, like I said, the Mesopotamians, in Eastern culture, in Asian, ancient Asian cultures, ancient African cultures, ancient uh, Norwegian cultures, all of these things, their major, their highest honor to their gods was human sacrifice. And it originated in Mesopotamia. And when God really needed to be honored in these polytheistic societies, I'm talking about when it was a drought and when people were dying and you needed to appease the God of rain to send rain, you needed to give the greatest sacrifice your village could possibly give, it would be a human child sacrifice. That's what Abraham was raised in. Those society, that type of society, and in his mind and in his idea, the greatest way to honor a God is human child sacrifice. That's what Abraham grew up in. God is asking Abraham to do what Abraham considers to be the greatest honor. It's weird. It's crazy. True worship will always begin with God working with you where you are and how you are. And one of our biggest problems is, at least in my lifetime and in generations that I know of because I've lived this thing out, my parents have lived this thing out, I've watched it unfold in my lifetime, is this. We never, ever consider the fact that God can use somebody unless they change first. And we never consider that somebody can come and bring worship that would honor God until they fully are like us and they understand us and they've changed their thoughts and their ways and their patterns and all of this kind of stuff. Okay, today, we, you know, we had to change things up kind of last minute. We didn't have a drummer today. Zach had to move over to the drums. And Jet, who's been learning to play the guitar, he's like, you know, I'll step in, I'll play the guitar. And he came up here, and I looked across the way, and there's my son playing the guitar in shorts. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you that when I was his age, they'd have thrown you out the window. No, you ain't listen. Because what they would do is, we want you to be part of worship, but don't think you can be part of our worship until you have fully changed. God was so radical about this idea that he let a guy think who was still thinking in terms of ancient Mesopotamian religions, how you honor the God in the highest sense in those ancient religions. He let that guy start out with his own understanding that was even so crazy and wrong. But it's what he knew. And when God will really begin to work on somebody because they have a heart to truly worship him, the first thing God will do is say, just bring me what you have. What do you have? I know you don't understand everything. I know that things aren't right. I know you've got even a skewed, crazy idea about some things you don't understand. But here's the deal. God will take what we even do wrong and see honor in it and say, they, but they love me. How do I know that? Because I have grown up my whole life being wrong about so many things, but God still honored it. I have prayed prayers that were even unscriptural, thinking I need to pray for somebody to be healed, pray for some miracle, and I didn't even understand. I didn't know what I was doing because I still had a mind that was religious, and I still had a mind that was caught up in traditions and all kinds of things, and I thought that people still had to do X, Y, and Z, even when God didn't even say that, and I prayed, and God still honored. Why? Because sometimes God looks at people like, David who has committed adultery and committed murder but he looked on the inside and he said but inside of that man who doesn't understand everything and he's still doing everything wrong who was David truly David expressed to God his true heart why because David knew how to give God his worship and he would say God I don't know what to do I don't know what to do God we're bringing the ark into town I don't know I, I don't know I'll dance I'll dance for you every 10 steps if I have to 
I'll shout, I'll take the shirt off if I have to, which is crazy. That's all the people that used to tell us we had to wear the pants and the long sleeves. I'd say, go tell David about him taking his shirt off and God honoring that, dear God. You know, hey, heaven's sakes, we got so many things where God is saying, you know what? I don't care that you're wrong. I don't care that you don't understand. I don't care that you are way off on this idea. What God saw in Abraham was a guy who packed up and went across the wilderness for three days because God told him to do something, and I'm going to go do it. That's what he saw, and God said, that's honor. That's honor. The lad and I go to worship. True worshipers say, I may be wrong, I may be right. We'll figure that out when we get there but I'm stepping forward for God right now. And way too many people still have in their mind that somehow there is some religious change you do first and then you can start stepping in line with everybody else. And some people hold back on worshiping God because they feel like, I don't know if I'm right, I don't know if I'm wrong. Oh, God loves that heart. Abraham, you think you were raised in a society where killing your firstborn child is the highest honor to God. I tell you what, you're dead wrong. We'll deal with that later, but let's go with, come, give me what you've got. Let's go. And he went across the way to worship. And it was three days journey. You know how much you got to prepare for a three days journey? You don't do that on a whim. You got to pack food. They're in a desert. They got to pack water. Got to have enough food for the animals that they're bringing. He's bringing servants. This is a dangerous area, too. There's enemies out there. You got to have weapons. You got to have people who know how to protect you. He's got to make all this provision for a journey across the wilderness for three days in order to worship. Do you know how many people wouldn't have even started because of how much work had to be done to get there? And do you know that so many people hold back from worship because it's not easily given to you on a platter? Right? I think another one of the mistakes that we have made in society and in modern Western religious society is that we have made worship so easy. When I say worship, we've made worship so easy. Here's a song list. Here's a set list. If you don't like this one, you can do that one. And if you don't like a contemporary uh, service, if you don't like a new type of songs, we'll do another church service two hours before that one. Pick which one you want to come to. All these things have their place, but I want you to understand we've made worship too easy. We've made worship to where I'm going to pick and choose what I want when worship is supposed to be about honoring somebody other than you. And we're supposed to be saying, God, I will make the journey and do what it takes. I will do the work. I will take the preparation. I will do what it takes. Abraham could not have gone across that thing in any sense of the idea with ease. It took work. It took preparation. It took effort. And I will tell you, God is looking for true worshipers who say, I will push past adversity to worship you. I will push past distances to worship you. I will push past everything to get where you need me to be to honor you and to worship you. And Jesus, when he's talking about true worshipers, he's talking about that. Abraham had to take a three-day journey that took a lot of preparation to get there. Third thing, in order to go worship and in order to go do what God has asked him to do, he couldn't do it with some trivial thing. He had to take the most precious thing in his life and plan on giving it to the Lord. What was most precious to him. Because worship is all about a perspective. 
Worship does not serve the purpose of some traditional uh, program of some go through the motions, let's do this stuff, and then church will be good. Worship is about you changing your mindset and change, being so close to him. Because he says he inhabits the praises of his people. So our praises and our worship are designed from our end to draw the presence of heaven close to us. But there should be a response from us when heaven gets close. I talked to you about the woman who came and washed the feet of Jesus. And I talked about the fact that Jesus was in the room with somewhere between 12, 15 people, 12 of them being his disciples. And there they sat with him, probably, probably shooting the breeze, probably joking around. These guys literally had no idea that they had less than seven days with this man until he died had no idea and so there they went shooting the breeze probably telling jokes probably just cracking up probably having a great old time which is fine you should rest you should relax but a woman came into the room and the moment she was in the presence of Jesus she began to weep and the men around Jesus didn't understand what is going on here. Why is she crying? Why is she pouring out this oil? What's going on? And Jesus is saying, guys, you don't understand. You don't know that you've only got seven days left with six days left with me. You have no idea. And here you are in my presence and it doesn't mean anything to you. She came into the room, not a word was spoken and she couldn't help but weep. What worship is supposed to do is bring presence so close that the presence begins to affect you. And worship is supposed to bring the presence so close that you cannot think the way that you were thinking five minutes ago. What it's supposed to do is take all of the thoughts and all of the problems and all of the anxieties that you mentally brought into this place this morning and that you mentally brought with you in all of the heaviness and all of that, and it's supposed to the, be that the presence of God some, comes so close and you feel it so powerfully that you change the way that you think. You can't tell me for a moment that Abraham did all of this without anxiety. Like, oh gosh, taking this kid, man. Mom's at home. I've prayed for this child for 25 years. And he goes and he's taking what is most precious to him. When in 2022, instead of God getting what is most precious from his worshipers, I like to say it like this, God gets our leftovers. Because see, God gets our leftover time, doesn't he? I've always said, we, I, I've always thought this way, not always thought this way, but God has really changed some things in my heart and in my mind. We want God, we want to be, you, you and I, we want to be God's top priority. We want God to give us his first and best, but we give him our leftovers and our pocket change. I'm not, not talking about tithing, not talking about giving. I'm talking about God, what have I got left over? You can have that. See, in... Old Testament. In the Old Testament, I think, it, I want to say it's the book of Haggai. It's not. It's not. It's Malachi. Book of Malachi. He says to the people, you've got a problem. Now for them, it was in their, what they were giving to the temple. Okay? I want you to understand this was just an example. They weren't giving money. They were giving animals, food, things like that to sustain the workers in the temple. But Malachi came and he said, you all ought to be ashamed of yourselves. That's what he said. Because God has asked you for your first and your best. But he was saying, you're giving the temple, you're giving God your diseased animals. You're giving him your cattle that have anthrax and that, 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 are, that uh, are blind, missing goats that are missing their eyes. They're going to live for about, th those are the ones. He's saying, you guys are taking all the stuff that you were going to throw away anyway, your leftovers. And you're giving that to the temple and expecting it to be sacrifice. And you're giving that to the temple and you're expecting that to be worship. 
When in fact, he's saying true worshipers, they brought what was most precious to them. Why won't we give God what is most precious to us? Because we don't believe in a God who's able to take what we have that is most precious to us and give it back to us ten times. If we truly believed that and we understood that, he would get our first and our best. And it's why he gives us his first and his best. But worship is about bringing to him what is most precious to you. Instead of, God, if I've got any left over, it's yours. If I've got any left over this week, you can have. If I have any left over time, you can have that. If I have any left over effort, you can have that. Worship is changing our perspective and saying, God, your presence has changed me. And I would give anything to stay in that presence. Okay. So the lad and I go yonder to worship. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. And we will come back to you. True worship has always been about desiring God's presence, period. And these men in the Bible who did such great, drastic things, Solomon built an altar and offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. Abraham was willing to climb a mountain with his son and sacrifice his only son. Noah was willing to build a boat. David was willing to take everything that was precious to his, to his kingdom and take it all and build a temple, which ultimately his son did. All of these men in the Bible that would, would give everything in order to truly worship him the way to truly worship God, it was because they knew and they understood the most precious thing that you can have is the presence of God. And the thing that will change you the most is the presence of God. So Abraham is willing to sacrifice his child. And you know what? He is dead wrong. He is confused. He is wrong. Don't do that. Don't kill your child. But God is letting him take these first steps in that direction, even with that mindset. And then he gets up on the mountain. He's going to sacrifice his child. Isaac says to him, you know, Dad, here's the wood, here's the rope, here's the fire, all that kind of stuff. Where's the, where's the lamb? Where's the sacrifice? Abraham says to him, my son, God will provide for himself a lamb. And he lays the boy down. He's going to do it. He's literally going to do this. But something shifts on that mountain and something changes on that mountain. And it changed and shifted the moment that Abraham's hand was coming down. And at that moment, an angel caught it. Stay your hand, Abraham, and do the child no harm. And then he looks over, and over here in the bushes is a ram with its horns caught in the thicket. And Abraham went over there and got it, and he sacrificed. What happened there? What happened there? The same thing that happens when we are willing to go the distance with God in worship. God, I'll, I'll do, I'll, I'll Sound crazy? Look crazy? I don't care. I'm willing to go the distance. I'm willing to put in effort that others wouldn't put in. I'm willing to bring what is precious even if others are not. I'm willing to do that. I guarantee you, in that worship, a transition will happen. And the transition at that time was, Abraham, you have had this mindset up until now, and I've worked with it, but now we're going to start having my mindset. And my mindset is not, you give me your son. My mindset is, I'll give you my son. You see what shifted? And I can show you scripturally about how Abraham knew this. Abraham knew the moment that he was climbing that mountain that Isaac was coming back down with him. He knew that. 
He knew that he knew that his son, one way or another, was going to survive all of this. He didn't know how, but here's the thing: when it comes to worship, true worshipers continue following him even when you don't have all of the answers, even when you don't have all of the understanding. The Bible says that the peace of God is peace that passes all understanding. It's not that you don't understand the peace. See, you can have peace in this world right now without God. You just have to have all the understanding. All of your situations, all the things you're going through, if you could just understand it all, you'd have peace about it. But God says the peace of this world requires you to understand everything. The peace I give requires no understanding. You're going to have peace. You're going to have just as many answers Tomorrow, as you had today, you're still not going to know. You're still not going to know how this works. You're still not going to know when, where, or how. But the difference is you're going to have peace. In worship, you shift from a worldly mindset to a heavenly mindset. And in the worldly mindset, Abraham could only go with what he knew child sacrifice for Mesopotamia. But then God says, no, you've got it all backwards. And in the midst of worship, he shifts the mindset and he says, at this point, we are no longer thinking with your traditional worldly mindset. Now we're going to think with my heavenly mindset. No more, no more uh, giving me your son. Not one more time in scripture did God ever ask anybody to bring their son. Not one time. And he only did this as a way of testing or to push Abraham farther because Abraham needed to take some more steps in his life toward where God was bringing him. So in the midst of all of this, he shifts his mindset. And above all things, worship should get you thinking differently. Worship should get you thinking differently about him. Worship should get you thinking differently about what, is, what, what God has brought into our into our opportunities worship I, this is not where I was going to go but I feel I feel this worship can never exist without hunger See, some people do things that they think is worship. <coughs> and, and some people are, you know, yeah, we're giving effort. We want to do this. We want to worship the king. We want to honor the king. But at the same time, if you didn't, if somebody were to tell you at that moment, no, we're not going to do that. I don't want you to do that. Sit down. Okay. You're, you're fine with not doing it, right? You, you understand what I mean? Like, you've heard some people say, like, or they post memes and all this kind of stuff where they say, like, yeah, I, would go to, I would go to China. I would go to jail for God. Like, no, you wouldn't. You absolutely How do I know you wouldn't go to jail for God? Because you don't go to church for God if it's raining. You can tell me you're going across the world to China and go to jail for God when you won't go across town because it snowed last night? Oh, I would do this. Here's the thing. Here's what hunger does. Hunger will not, if you have enough hunger, no one can tell you no. Y'all seen peop, some people, uh, you know, they, you, you've heard some stories about some people, they will steal things out of stores. It's against the law to steal things, right? What'd they steal? They're stealing food. They're hungry. And people who've never broken the law in their life broke that window and went in there and got that can of beans or whatever, all this kind of stuff. You're like, what? why? Because hunger will get you to not listen to the nose. And in worship, it requires hunger. Uh, I need to, need to expound on this here. When you are hungry for his presence, you'll worship without music. When you're hungry for his presence, you will worship when no one else is. You'll lift your hands even though, like, nobody else is. Hunger causes you to suddenly not care 
about the carnal things. And so worship requires hunger, hunger for his presence. And I stop and I think about the things in, in, in generations that have erased the hunger. Erased the hunger for his presence. I don't want to take too much time with this, and I, 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 need, to, I need to pace this, but God is leading me to bring a few things out. One of the reasons why people are not hungry for his presence is because they have put their faith in other things that have taken the place of his presence. And I'm not talking about worldly things. In Scripture, this, this, this is the kind of stuff they used to beat my brains out with in, in, in preaching. And, and for, for good reason, it kept me in line. Maybe it was needed for that time. I don't know. But they would talk about, you know, you can't, a little leaven will leaven the whole lump. And you know what they was talking about? They was talking about you, you, if you've got one part of your life where you're not living right, it messes up all the rest. And we'd talk and we'd preach about, uh, uh, you know, you can't live in you can't live heavenly and live in the world at the same time because we think that every time the Bible is talking about mixing things and a little leaven and, and mix up, we think that it's talking about righteousness and sin trying to be mixed together. When in fact, when you read all of those scriptures about not being able to mix these things, not being able to add leaven without it affecting the whole lump. Every single time that Paul was talking about that, if you read the scriptures and you read all the context, he's talking about mixing law and grace. He's not talking about mi mixing sin and righteousness. That's a whole other discussion. He's talking about mixing law and grace. Read the book of Galatians. It's all through there. When he says, don't mix this, little leaven can leaven the whole lump, he's talking about you're trying to live by grace and hold on to things of the law. You're trying to mix the two, and that don't work. What he was doing was he was showing the parts where he was saying, look, what Jesus did, I guess we're going to do, I guess we're just going to get real basic like this. What Jesus defeated and what Jesus accomplished took care of everything that the law ever tried to do. In other words, there's no part of that law that's still necessary. The grace of God is now what you have your faith in. And in the grace of God, you need, to, you need his presence. You need to hear from him. You need to walk with him. The problem with those disciples in that room when the woman was washing his feet, why they weren't feeling something but she was, because they took for granted what walking with him was doing for them. They took for granted the fact that every day of their life for 33 and a half years they got to walk the streets with Jesus, when in fact under the law, literally only like four people are ever mentioned to walk with God. And every single one of them was like super special. Enoch got taken to heaven. Elijah got taken to heaven. Walking with God, big deal. Until the time of Jesus and disciples who walk with him every day and they take it for granted. But a woman who comes in the room that doesn't spend all of her time, she is depressed. She's hungry to walk with him. Hungry for the presence. So what we have grown up in and what we have seen now is people who are supposed to have a hunger and a desire to walk with Jesus, doctrines and re religious platforms have taught them how to use other things to take that place. Self-righteousness. I might be going too fast here, but the thing we should be hungry for is his, walking with him in his presence, yet things that have taken the place are traditional religious things, things that make us carnally feel better. 
That's why we started dressing the way that we dressed in church and acting the way that we acted. And no quick cut in the hair and take off all the makeup, all the stuff that I grew up in, all the religious stuff that we said, here's the things you need to be hungry for. And they would stand up on a platform and say, you better cut that hair. You better t- button that top button. You better not wear shorts up in the pulpit when you play the guitar. Better take that, make all that other stuff that we started saying, here's the things you need to be hungry for. You need to be hungry for this self-righteous stuff. And we now sit here, you know, in a more, we feel like a more modern church and we feel like, you know, all this stuff, oh, well, we don't do that. We need to take everything in our lives that we are more hungry for than God's presence and examine every single one of them. Every single thing in our lives where we say, I'm really, I, I have a deep hung, hunger for this. And we need to start doing the, th- we need to start being passionate about worship. The most popular churches in this nation right now are churches that have the super celebrity preachers. Because what we're hungry for is good preaching. And we also look for people who have the most snazziest entertainment and the best musicians because what we're hungry for is perfection in all of these things. We're hungry for a good sound, a good look, a popular preacher, somebody who makes us feel better, somebody who can say all these things. And God is using people. God can use anybody he wants. And God can, can, can use all of these things. But the problem is it is really hard to find people in in in. in God's kingdom, and especially in, in, in uh, God help me, especially in this Western society that we live in, it's really hard to find people who their truest and deepest desire is, God, I want your prayer. I don't care if that guy never preaches again. If you are in the room every single time, that's what I need. It's really hard to find that. It's really hard to find the idea that says, God, this has never been about who's the pastor, who's the preacher, what church is it, what's the denomination, and what is the music, what is the style. And we have, our, we have our hungers for those types of things. It's really hard pressed to find somebody who says, God, I don't care if they never play a chord. I'll worship you in, even if they're silent. Because that hunger is so strong. What would make a man journey across the wilderness with his son willing to literally sacrifice him because it's the only thing he knows? What would take? It takes a hunger that says, God, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't understand what's going on. I don't have the answers to this. I don't know this. And God, I know that if this day ends and you still have not given me the answer, I'm okay with that as long as I get to walk with you today. As long as I get to stand next to you and walk with you, then I don't care about any of those answers. I don't care about any of those things. I don't need answers to those. I don't need understanding with those. That's fine. I will still have peace as long as I get to walk with you. As long as I get to be in your presence. As long as I get to go the distance with you. I will do this great, crazy thing that I feel in my heart because I, I don't understand it. I don't know what I'm doing, but God, this is what I know and I'm going to go do it. I, I believe that what Jesus meant when he said that true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. And they, I'm going to close right here in two minutes. He was talking to a group of people who were scared to death to do it wrong. The Jewish people in Jerusalem were scared to death to do anything wrong. Because why? Because the Pharisees and the priests right there in the temple would correct somebody. They would literally might, might whip them, might stone them. You don't do things that way. You don't do things like that. Look what they did to Jesus when he came to town and they started singing a different song. They killed him. Look what happened when, the, when, 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 when people came in and, and, and when people uh, would, would, would come in there and, and, and start shouting and they would come to Jesus and they would say, tell your people to shut up. And that's when Jesus said, if they hold their peace, the rocks will cry out. Why? Because the people were so afraid to do it wrong. And what we have now is a group of people and they say, oh, I don't want to do anything wrong, so I just won't do nothing. When in fact, God's preference is do it wrong and do it bold. Do it wrong and do it loud. Do it wrong and do it for me. If God was willing to let a man think he needed to kill his son and he was that wrong, if God was willing to let somebody go with that, 
then your little misunderstandings of what you're supposed to do and the things you may or may not be right about or you may or may not be wrong about, it doesn't matter. God, I give you what I have. I push through adversity, give you what I have. We'll fix what's right and wrong when we get there. But God, I, I, I just want to go with you. I just want to walk with you, and I have that hunger. So we're going to pray here in a second. If you guys will come to the music, we're going to pray. And the thing I want us praying in this church is that there will come supernaturally by the voice, by the anointing of heaven in this church, in this building, there will be more hunger for worship than ever before. Amen? Let's stand to our feet. We're going to... Uh, we're gonna um, you're going to play a, a, a song while we, while we pray. But I want to pray with you for just a minute. God, I'm, I'm praying, I'm asking in the name of Jesus. God, I feel your voice speaking. I know there's, God, I know that there's maybe even confusion right now. But I'm, I'm praying in the midst of all of it, in the midst of all of it, there are hearts in this room that say, God, I don't know, I don't understand, but I do know that I want to walk with you. I do know that I want to hear your voice. I want to be with you. I want, I want you to speak to me. So God, help me have a desire and a hunger that I've never had before. Because God, I know that in worship is your presence. And in your presence is miracles. In your presence is healing. In your presence is peace and joy. In your presence are things knit back together that, that could have never been done without your supernatural hand working. So I pray in your precious name. I pray in the name of Jesus. Let your voice speak to somebody right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah and amen. Just find your place to pray. Thank you, Jesus. I was shackled by him.